What's your minimum specification? One, one of the things that we've noted you doing as you go from company to company is, you know, the topic of building a team. Um, you know, and as you build more teams, we've seen certain people take engineers from a team they've built at a previous company to the next company. You know, it's, have you got any insights into how you build your teams and have there been any different approaches at the companies that you worked for on this? Well, the first thing you have to realize is, are you building the team or finding one? So there's a great museum in Venice, uh, the, the David Museum. In the front of the museum, there's these huge blocks of marble, uh, yeah. 20, 20 by 20 by 20. How they move them, I don't know. And the block of marble is sitting there. And, you know, Michelangelo could see this beautiful sculpture in it. It was already there. Right. Yeah. The problem was removing the excess marble. So if you go into a company with a thousand employees, I guarantee you there's a good team there. You don't have to hire anybody. We didn't hire any. When I was at AMD, I hardly hired anybody. You know, we moved people around, we deployed people, let's say. And, uh, but there was plenty of great people there. When I went to Tesla, so, we had to build a team from scratch because there was nobody at Tesla that was building chips. And, you know, I hired people that I knew, but then we hired a bunch of people that I didn't know at some point. And then this is one of those interesting things. If you only hire, you know, I've seen leaders go from one company to another and they bring their 20 people mm. and then they start trying to reproduce what they had before. And that's, that's a bad idea because 20 people is enough to reproduce it, but, but it alienates, you know, what you want it when you build a new team, you ideally you get people you really like, you know, either you just met them or you work with them, but you want some differences in approach and thinking because everybody gets into a local minimum. So the new team has this opportunity to make something new together. And some of that's because, you know, if you had 10 really great teams all working really well, and then you made a new team with one person from each of those teams, that may well be better because they will you know, re reselect which the best ideas were because every team has pluses right. and minuses. And so you have to think about if you're building a team or finding a team and then what's the, what's the dynamic you're trying to create that gives, gives it space for people to have new ideas or, and, you know, some people get stuck on one idea and then they work with new people and all of a sudden they're doing this incredible thing. You think, wow, they're great. They used to be not so great. What happened? Well, they were carrying some idea around that wasn't great. And then they met somebody who challenged them or the environment forced them or, you know, whatever, you know, happened. And all of a sudden they're doing a great job. And I've seen it happen so many times. I used to, Ken Olson at Digital said, there's no bad employees. There's just bad employee job matches. And when I was younger, I thought that was stupid. But as I work with more people, I've seen it happen so many bloody times that, you know, I've even fired people who went on to be really successful because they weren't doing a good job because they were stuck and emotionally they were committed to something that wasn't working. And the act of moving to a different place freed them up. You know, I don't get thank you notes, but I should. <laughs> so how, how much of that also comes down to sort of company culture? I mean, when you're looking for the person for the right position or whether you're hiring in for the new, mm -hmm. new position, do you try and get something that goes against the company grain or goes with the company grain? Do you have any tactics here or is no, it really depends on what you're doing? If you're trying to do something really innovative, it's probably mostly against. If you have right. a, have a project that's going really well, bringing in the instigators is going to slow everybody down because you know, you're already doing well. You have to read the, the group and the environment. And then there are some people who are really good, they're really flexible. They go on this project, I'm going to fit in and just push. But on the next one, I'm going to, you know, you, you can see them. They're building their network and team. And on the next project, they're ready to do a pivot. And everybody's willing to work with them. It's like trust is a funny thing, right? You know, if somebody walks up and says, jump off this bridge, you'll be fine. You're like, bullshit. But if you'd already been through a whole bunch of stuff with them and they said, look, trust yeah. me, you need to jump and you're going to be fine. It's going to suck, but it's going to be fine. You'll do it, right? And teams that trust each other are way more effective than ones that 
have to do everything with contracts, negotiation, and politics. So it, that's probably one not, thing. If you're building a team, you know, building or finding a team, when you start seeing people, let's say, doing politics, which means manipulating the environment for their own benefit, um, they got to go. Unless they're the boss. And then, you know, then you have to see if they deliver. Like some people are very political, but they really, they think their political strength comes from delivering. Yeah. But but people randomly in an organization that are political just cause lots of stress. Do you recommend that sort of uh, early mid-career engineers, they, you know, bounce around regularly from project to project just so they don't get stuck in a hole? So it sounds like that seems to be a common thing. You learn fastest when you're doing something new, working for somebody that knows way more than you. So if yeah. you're relatively early in the career and you're not learning a lot or, you know, the people that you're working for aren't inspiring you, then, yeah, you should probably change. Um, so there's some careers where I've seen people bounce around three times because they're getting experience and they end up being good at nothing. And they would have been yeah. better staying where they were and really getting deep at something. So, you know, creative tension. There's creative tension between those two ideas. So, I mean, to, to what extent do you spend your time mentoring others, either inside organizations or externally with co previous co-workers or students? Do you ever envision yourself doing something on a more serious basis, like the Jim Keller School of Semiconductor Design? No. So, no, it's funny because uh, I'm mostly mission-driven. Like, we're going to build Zen, we're going to build Autopilot, you know. And then there's people that work for me. And then as soon as they start working for me, I start figuring out who they are. And then some of them are, you know, are fine. And some of them have big problems that need to be, let's say, you know, dealt with one way or the other. So then, you know, I'll, I'll tell them what I want. Sometimes I'll give them some say, pointed advice. Sometimes I'll, I'll do stuff and you can tell some people are really good at, you know, learning by, you know, following. And then people later on tell me that I was mentoring them, and I'm thinking, I thought I was kicking your ass. But, you know, it's, it's a it's a funny experience. I have, you know, there's quite a few people that said I impacted their life in some way, and but some of it was like, you know, you know, I went after them about their health or diet because I thought they thought they looked, you know, not energized by life, or <clears throat> you know, you can really make really big improvements there, and it's worth doing, by the way. Or they're doing the wrong thing and they're just not excited about it. You can tell they should be doing something else. So they either got to figure out why they're not excited or get excited. And then a lot of people start, you know, fussing with themselves or with other people about their status or something. And the best way to have status is to do something great. And then everybody thinks you're great. Having status by trying to claw your way up is terrible because everybody thinks you're a climber. And, you know... And, and sometimes they just don't have the confidence or skill to, you know, make the right choice there. So, but, but it mostly comes out of, you know, being mission driven. Like, like I do care about people. At least I try to. Um, and, and then I see the results. I mean, it's really gratifying to get a big complicated project done and you know where it was when you started and then you know where it was when it was done. And then people, people, when, they work on successful things, associate the leadership and the team they're working with, with, with being part of that. So that's, that's really great. Um, it doesn't always happen, but it's, so, I would have a hard time doing that. Just quote mentoring people. Cause what's the mission? Like somebody comes to you and says, I want to get better. Well, better at what? Well, then that's, you know, like, well, I want to be better at, you know, playing violin. Well, it's like, I'm not good at that. Or, you know, whereas I say, hey, we're going to build the world's fastest, you know, autopilot chip. And then everybody working on it needs to get better at doing that. And it turns out three quarters of their problems are actually personal, not technical. Right. Yeah. So to get the autopilot chip, you have to go go debug all that stuff. You know, and, you know, there's all kinds of problems, you know, like health problems and parental childhood problems and, you know, partner problems and workplace problems and, you know, career stall problems. And Jesus, the, the list is so bloody long, but you have to take them all seriously. Like, you know, it turns out everybody thinks their own problems are really important, right? Like you may not think their problems are important, but I tell you, they do. They have a list. You ask anybody, what's your top five problems, 
right? They can probably tell you. Or even weirder, they give you the wrong five because you can see the yeah. other five, right? That happens too. But they, they definitely give you the five they think you want. They give you the five that they think you want to hear rather than the actual. Yeah, or the, yeah. you know, people have no fly zone. So their biggest problem may be something they don't want to talk mm. about. Mm. So, you know, but if you, if you saw, if you help them solve that, then the project will go better. And then at some point they'll appreciate you. And then they'll say you're a mentor and you're thinking, yeah, kind of, I don't know. <laughs> 